Now it's official. Good evening. On behalf of the Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies program, I want to welcome you all to Gustavus Adolphus College, if you're from not around these parts, and to the 2016 Mo Lecture. Uh, I'm Martin Lang. I'm faculty in the Communication Studies Department, and I'm also very proud, especially on days like today, to be the director of the Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies program here. GWSS at Gustavus is an interdisciplinary program that draws on expertise on faculty from across the spectrum of disciplines on the campus uh, to study gender and sexuality in the context of a range of other categories of social difference, including race, um, class, nationality, religion, ability, age, and more. If your life is impacted by any of the categories that I just listed, then GWS could be or should be a place for you. So, Gustavus students, I'll be signing major declaration forms at the edge of the stage <laughs> at the end of the talk. Uh, Gustavus faculty, feel free to forward your course proposals to me directly. And uh, if you're not from the campus, um, the program will happily accept your monetary donations to continue the excellent programming like this for generations to come. And if not that, at least say nice things about us when you go elsewhere. Um, before I introduce the person who's going to introduce the person who you all came here to see, just a little bit of business, I have some thank yous uh, to some of the people who helped to make this event happen. Um, first of all, event services for all their tech setup. Uh, they won't get a chance to be acknowledged later, but if you would give a little round of applause to the crowd at the back and other places for their help today. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank Dining Services, especially Margie Wilmert, for hosting a lovely meal for us. Um, some of us, anyway. Sorry about that, just before this event. <laughs> Marketing Communication, and particularly Barb Larson Taylor, who's also in the back of the room, for all their help to ensure that you learned about this event tonight. A round of applause, please. The students and staff of the Diversity Center for all of your support in the preparations. Uh, the students and faculty of GWSS for creating an environment where this kind of thing can happen. It's really a wonderful place to be. And all the countless people I certainly have omitted from my, from my thank yous who contributed to bring this event to life. Thank you very much. I'm very excited. Uh, I also need to thank Karen and Robert Moe, who's in, who endowed the lecture that, that bears their name um, in honor of their daughter, Chris Moe, who uh, is a Gustavus alum. Um, Bob Moe passed away quite recently. Um, but I hope he would have been pleased to see the fruits of his family's work coming to life here on the stage. The Mo Lecture allows GWSS to bring the brightest feminist minds to our little corner of the world to share their inspiration and their expertise, and it's really a, an incredibly rare resource. Uh, we are the envy of, of many other places for the kind of work that we're doing. So uh, if you bump into a Mo or have a mind to send a thank you letter to somebody this year, let me know, I can, I can tell you um, where to direct that. Karen deserves many thanks. But without further ado, I want to bring to the stage senior GWSS major Leah Soul. Um, many of you probably know Leah Soul. She has a, quite a presence around campus this last couple years. She's serving as the academic assistant this year for GWSS. Uh, she's also the co-coordinator of the Mo lecture this year. And she, and not last but not least, she's been the primary source of my sanity over the last four or five months. So uh, Leah. It is an honor and a pleasure to welcome Professor Kimberly Crenshaw to Gustavus as the 2016 Mo Lecturer. Professor Crenshaw is a leading authority in the area of civil rights, black feminist legal theory, and race, racism, and the law. She's a professor of law at UCLA and directs the Center for Intersectionality and Social Policy Studies at Columbia Law School, which she founded in 2011. Her original work on intersectionality, a theory that addresses how multiple identities and structures of power interact to create differential lived experiences of oppression, has transformed numerous fields of study, activism, and public policy. 
Professor Crenshaw has worked extensively within the US on a variety of issues pertaining to gender and race, including violence against women, structural, ra structural race inequality, and affirmative action. In 1996, she co-founded the African American Policy Forum to house a variety of projects designed to deliver research-based strategies to better advance social inclusion. Her work on intersectionality has also traveled globally and was inf influential in drafting the Equality Clause in the South African Constitution. Professor Crenshaw also authored the background paper on race and gender discrimination for the United Nations World Conference on Racism. For all this impressive work, Professor Crenshaw has been recognized in many quarters. She was recently awarded the Outstanding Scholar Award from the Fellows of the American Bar Foundation. She was honored in March as one of Harvard Law's, um, Law School's Women Inspiring Change, and in the same month was recognized by Diverse Issues in Higher Education as one of the top 25 women in higher education. In 2015, she was featured in the Ebony Power 100, a list honoring contemporary feminist heroes in the black community, and was number one on Ms. Magazine's list of feminist heroes of 2015. I can certainly say that Professor Crenshaw tops my personal list of feminist heroes. As a gender, women, and sexuality studies major, my understanding of feminism and social justice has been transformed by Professor, Cren by Professor Crenshaw's concept of intersectionality. It has given me the language to discuss identity and power with the nuance and complexity that these ideas require. Intersectionality has instilled in my feminism a sense of responsibility to carefully consider whom my activism serves and how it addresses multiple interconnecting systems of power. In short, Professor, Crenshaw, Professor Crenshaw's work has pushed me to become a better activist, scholar, and feminist. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kimberly Crenshaw. Good evening. So um, first, I have to I have to give a deeper thanks than 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 usual because the folks who brought me here have been working on that for about two years, uh, and they've been so incredibly patient um, and understanding. Um, I was all set to come here. Um, some time ago last year, and then um, I, I got an invitation to go to Selma to be there for the 50th anniversary. Um, and that's just something that doesn't come along too often. And so my hosts were so gracious in saying, we'll have you back at some time in the future, which you know people don't always do. So I want to thank Leah, Barb, and Martin, and everyone else who helped plan my, my trip here. Um, I'm also, you know, aware that, that I'm standing here in, in Minnesota at a time when the eyes of the world are actually looking at Minnesota. Um, I won't share with you how many times I've uh, flown into something that is world changing. It would probably scare you if I told you that. Um, but it, it did give me the opportunity to uh, pay my respects last night. And you know, it was it was kind of interesting. I don't know what I actually expected to see when it, when I went to Paisley Park, but um, I, I was glad to have been there. Um, and I was, you know, of course, I can't start talking um, about the world without acknowledging um, what the world has just lost uh, yesterday. But the typical ways of acknowledging it don't seem to do Prince justice. Like, I kind of don't want to say, so let's take a minute of silence. It just doesn't make sense for someone who has flooded our consciousness with sound, things that we'll never stop hearing. So I don't, I don't want to do, let's take a moment of silence. That doesn't make sense. So then I thought, well, why don't we do the opposite, right? And don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to sing. Um, <laughs> But I, I want to take 10 seconds and, and fill this room with sound. Uh, and, I, and I'm thinking maybe the sound should be every song that we individually can think of that Prince gave us. And we'll just do it for 10 seconds. And, we, and we'll try to like do it as loud as we can. And it'll just be like a music tornado of everything to recognize who this purple um, uh, god was. And if I had left knowing he was not going to be with us, I would have had something purple. This is the closest I could get. OK, so for 10 seconds, 
just throw it all out there. If you can't think of more than one song, just keep saying it over and over again. Okay? All right, on, on the count of three, one, two, three. Purple rain, when doves cry, little red Corvette, do me, baby. Purple rain. <laughs> we got five more seconds. Okay. Now, now that that does it for me, right? That that means that he he lives. He he lives. He's part of our soundtrack. Um, you know, a lot of you came into the soundtrack like way after I did. So you know, I kind of go way back. You might start ten years ago, fifteen years ago. Um, but we're all part of a community that has uh, walked the planet when uh, that musical genius was among us. So thank you for doing that with me. Um, so this is a transitional moment in so many different ways. Yeah, it's an election year for sure. Um, but. More importantly than that, um, it is the year where we have to decide what it means to have been post-racial. <laughs> and notice I'm saying that in the past tense, right? Um, because, uh, you know, maybe we thought we were post-racial when Barack Obama was elected. Maybe we still kept thinking we were post-racial when, you know, he was president while black. Um, maybe we continue to think we were kind of, kind of post-racial um, when um, all sorts of things started happening and the media finally had to say we still have a racial problem. But I think any remaining sense that we were post-racial is kind of gone with the, with the presidential campaigns, with you know, people basically making proposals that um, would have made folks 100 years ago a little puzzled. Um, I think the question isn't now whether we po are post-racial, but are we now post-post-racial? Uh, and if we are post-post-racial, what does that look like? What does it mean to have been through a period of time when we thought some major transformation in our society was a afoot because a person was elected president of the United States who didn't look like anyone else who'd ever been in the White House? Um, and now it turns out that, yeah, that was um, a singular moment, but uh, what that moment was about wasn't nearly as much as people thought it was going to be about. Right? Um, we gained a black president. We lost the only black senator we had at that time. I mean, that was sort of a good trade off, I suppose. But it suggests that there was still a racial set of problems that would continue even after the White House uh, became occupied by um, a black family. So, so there's a question of how we read backward where we've been over the last eight years and how we think about where we're going to go next with the conversation that we've been having um, about race in American society. So some part of what I want to talk about tonight is ways of talking about things. Um, I have a way of thinking about things, a way of engaging things, a way of talking about things. It's, it's shaped by my overall intellectual commitments to critical race theory. Most specifically, it's shaped by um, my interest, my tool, which I call intersectionality. It's like a handy all-purpose thing. I take it out, I put it on, I see different things than I might have seen had I not been using that tool. So what I want to talk about is how I've been seeing things over the last couple years, seeing things that might not seem to be things that a lot of my allies have been seeing. In particular, I've been seeing things that some of my allies in the anti-racist movement um, have been seeing differently than I do. And so I've been curious about why we see these things differently and have been talking about them. Um, and that talk has turned into some projects and that projects uh, have turned into some movements. Some of them might be um, familiar, some might not be. I want to talk about all of them uh, today. But one of the most important things that 
I want to put on the table um, before we even get started um, is um, the idea of what post-racialism uh, has uh, contributed to some of the challenges that then in turn I've been trying to think about in terms of intersectionality. Um, so post-racialism is the backdrop against which a lot of the projects that we've been involved in at the African American Policy Forum might be defined. Um, we've been doing some work called Say Her Name that I'm going to talk about in a bit. Say Her Name um, is a project that is situated alongside and within Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter itself is a project that runs against the assumption um, that those lives don't. Not necessarily declared that they don't, but acted in a way that they don't. Institutions making those lives matter less. Say Her Name is an effort to say not only black lives as defined uh, by men um, or male identified bodies, but uh, by all lives um, that are circumscribed by anti-black racism. So we've been talking about and lifting up some of the other bodies whose lives have been lost to uh, state sanctioned violence or whose bodies have been abused uh, by uh, officers who uh, uh, are rapists with badges. So um, Say Her Name is a project against the denial of post-racialism that these problems uh, still exist. Um, more broadly, uh, Say Her Name uh, is alongside of another project called Why We Can't Wait. Uh, and Why We Can't Wait is a set of projects that are engaged with some of the dominant ways of talking about racism that have excluded women and girls of color. The idea is women and girls of color cannot wait for racial justice to remember that they exist. That's also a project against the backdrop of post-racialism. So all of these ideas are ideas that we uh, lift up and want to uh, make part of our projects for thinking about race and racism uh, in the 21st century. Now, one of the things that uh, race and racism uh, is uh, defined by and, and um, now becomes part of the dominance uh, conversation about race um, is the distinction between uh, what was traditionally or pushed out of the conversation in post-racialism and what was in it. So what was pushed out of the conversation is any notion that racism still explains any part of our social uh, terrain. Um, what was not pushed out was the idea that race explains uh, part of our social terrain. So you might be scratching your head. How can you have a post-racialism that says racism is no longer explanatory, um, but race is explanatory? Well, I'll give you some examples of it that you might find familiar. Um, so when um, there's a debate about uh, the police uh, and any killing of an African American, um, those who support the idea um, that there probably wasn't any kind of police brutality will usually resort to um, explanations like, you know, blacks don't respect the police. Um, black men are uh, overly aggressive. Um, it's necessary to give police the benefit of the doubt because policing in those communities is particularly dangerous. Now, that's a racial explanation. Sometimes your most avid post-racialisms, uh, people who support post-racialism don't mind using a racial explanation to explain a particular kind of disparate outcome. Right? That's a distinction between saying we can't talk about race versus we can't talk about racism. Those folks talk about race. They just don't think that what they're saying is racist. Right? So, so when you have a formula that says, okay, there are certain racial differences, uh, differences in um, the attitude people have, the willingness to work, their respect for the police, that's a conversation about racial difference. What it's not is a conversation about racial power. So when you have assertions of racial difference as an explanation for a racial inequality, 
that doesn't have any acknowledgement about racial power, namely the history of racial discrimination, its current embodiment in a lot of our institutions, in our culture. When that's not part of the equation, you effectively have an argument that says individuals and groups are responsible for the things that happen to them. These are not structural problems. They're not institutional problems. They're individual level problems. And the solution to an individual level problem is an individual level solution. So it's not a matter of legal reform. It's not a matter of institutional reform. It's not a matter of new rules to constrain new possibilities. It's only a matter of reshaping individuals so they can fit within the avenues that are available for them in society. This idea that racial difference is the problem, not racial discrimination, as I'm going to talk about in a minute, is not a new idea. It's a very old idea. What's new about it, I want to suggest, is the way that intersectional failures have made these ideas more palatable now than they ever have been in our recent history. I want to suggest that these ideas that racial individual level differences are the differences that cause inequality is an argument that defeated many aspects of the civil rights movement. And it's an argument that's come back into popularity in part because of the most recent breakthrough of the President of the United States. So it is a complicated argument. It's a controversial argument. I mean to be controversial tonight. I think we're in a controversial moment. And I actually want to have it out. I want to talk about it now that we're moving post-post-racialism. So I'm going to just talk about the way we talk about some stuff tonight um, and then um, end with some voices who really don't tend to get heard because we're doing all the talking. So I'm going to try not to talk too much so you can hear some of these voices. So I want to start by saying something um, about framing because intersectionality basically is a frame. It's a way of challenging the existing ways that we think and talk about things. Um, and a way of offering new ways of framing those. So first we have to know a little something uh, about framing. So here's a little exercise. This is call and response. So since we already did a little call and response, I think you're going to be with me on this. So I'm going to ask you, um, these cows here are sick cows. Who's responsible for them? The farmer, thank you. The farmer is responsible for the sick cows. Now, how do we know the farmer is responsible for the sick cows? Partly because of the way the picture frames the sickness of the cows, right? All you do is you see some cows grazing in the grass. I tell you they're sick. Your background understanding in our culture, in our society, is that farmers are responsible for their stuff. People are responsible for their own stuff. Right? So if there's a social problem, generally our inference is that the ones who own them or are them are responsible for any problem that they might have. But if we changed our frame, it sometimes changes the analysis. Right? It changes our sense of, well, why are the sick cows sick? It changes our sense about who should be responsible for doing something about it. It changes our idea about what happens to us if the cows are allowed to remain sick. It changes our notion that this is a problem that we don't have to pay any attention to because it won't impact us at all. So with this picture, how do we answer all those questions differently? Who's responsible for the, th the sick cows now? The pollution. What happens if we just allow the cows to remain sick? What happens to us? We probably get sick. Who should do something about that? Us, right? And we can go on and on about, well, what should be done? What are the uh, kinds of strategies that need to happen in order to protect the sick cows, to protect the environment, and to protect ourselves? I want you to think about that analogy and now think about it as the way in which social problems are thought about. So the first picture, um, which just showed a dis-ease, you know, some kind of problem. In that first picture, our assumption is those who actually have the dis-ease are responsible for the dis-ease. And anything that's going to happen in order to make it change doesn't involve us at all. We don't have to be worried about it. 
Now, if we think about that in terms of racial inequality, we might think that this dis-ease is solely the responsibility of those who are diseased, those who are facing a whole range of racial disparities from health to education to employment um, to housing. We might think in this picture that it's their problem, right? So we generate explanations for it, right? Unwillingness to uh, defer gratification. That's one of the, the classic ones that explains why we have social inequality. Inculcation of the wrong values, that's another one. Listening to the wrong music, that actually um, is kind of relevant given what we just started with, right? There was a whole societal conversation about how princess music was going to undermine social values and we're going to lose a generation to the kind of things that people listen to, right? Listening to too much hip hop, listening to too much rap. Another explanation for why the cows might be sick and it's their own responsibility, not enough bulls in the herd, right? It's another argument. It's a classic one. It's been around for a long time. So when we think about our social problems, we think about them like this, it's easy to say those problems are not our problems. But when we broaden it and we understand that in a social, historical, cultural space that is shaped and defined, by racial power, by racial inequality, by institutions that were designed to create and perpetuate that, that these inequalities are part of an environment, and that environment is part and parcel of the disease that we all have to be attending to. It also tells us that we cannot let these diseases continue and think that we are also unimpacted by that. So this is just a way in which we understand how frames tell us what kind of problem it is, who's responsible for it, who's got to do something different, and what we can afford to do while we sit by and not let something happen. So now let's take what we've learned um, about frames. Um, and think about how frames have done a certain kind of work in how we think about racial inequality um, in this particular moment and what intersectionality has to do with it. So I want to give um, three examples about how inequality, how racial injustice in particular has been misframed because of what I call intersectional erasures, the inability to think about systems of subordination as not being separate, but as often being overlapping. And our failure to address what's overlapping as being an avenue that takes us to the picture of the sick cows without any responsibility on all of us. So I'm basically trying to make an argument that intersectionality matters if we want to move that frame from that narrow one to the broader one. Okay, so I'm going to talk about political um, arenas where there's intersectional erasure, research arenas where there's intersectional erasure, and activism where there is intersectional erasure. So um, in the political re arena, some of you recognize this picture, I'm sure. Um, it is a picture um, that uh, was taken in February 2014 uh, when uh, the president announced an, an initiative long overdue, highly anticipated, welcomed beyond measure to deal with racial inequalities that uh, impacted communities of color. And in this particular instance, um, what seemed to be most salient uh, was racism that impacted African-American boys. Um, part of the history of this was, as some of you might remember, after George Zimmerman was acquitted of killing Trayvon Martin, the president said that we need something to tell African-American men and boys that they are valued in this society. We care about them. Right? This jury verdict does not represent what America thinks and feels um, about its men and boys. And we've got to do something. He said, I'm going to use my bully pulpit. No government programs. But I can use my government. I can use my bully pulpit to actually make a difference. So um, what came out of it was my brother's keeper. It was a recognition that men and boys of color are facing particular kinds of obstacles that undermine um, their futures, that make them more likely uh, to be incarcerated, more likely to be killed, more likely to be underemployed. These are problems that the president says we need to address. 
And he was right. These are problems we need to address. The question is how to address it. The question is what kind of problem is this? The question is, is it the narrow frame? The problem is them, and we're going to help them by leading them in the right ways at an individual level, or was it the broader frame? Well, if we look at what the president said and we look at what my brother's keeper has gone on to do, men and boys are not framed as victims of racism, structural, institutional, or individual. They might be victims of race performances, but not racism. What are some of those race performances? They are the performances of living in single-headed households. They are the performances of not having strong uh, father figures in the community. They're the performances of not investing in education, but investing in a cool pose. It's all these ideas that boil down to there are some behavioral problems. They might be understandable where they come from, but the way we fix them is to create mentorship programs, to create individual level interventions, right? So what's on the table is a lot of individual kind of stuff, a helping hand, right? A kind, loving person. All that's important. But what's not part of the conversation, what wasn't on the table, is an understanding that this is all happening in the context of defunding public institutions, asset stripping of urban landscapes, the unleashing of the police force with diminished oversight from federal courts, the shifting of resources from service delivery to, to group management, the emphasis on individual punishment rather than institutional and structural reform. All these are background factors that are in the bigger picture, the clouds in the sky. So what this program really focuses on is the individuals, not the environment, not the context. The context is not mentioned. The racism, the racial power, is not one of the things that MBK is trying to fix. It's trying to fix the boys inside the power dynamic. A lot of people sometimes use the idea of the miner's canary. Do you guys know the miner's canary, right? The, the little canaries that were on the miners when they went into the coal mines, and the canaries um, would sometimes like fall over dead. Um, and that was like an early warning system. Get out of the mines. You know, carbon monoxide, you know, they can't handle it, you can't. So the idea is that the mine is toxic for everybody, right? Everybody needs to get out. But the miner's canary is used here basically to say that the boys are in danger, so we got to get, we got to figure out how to help them, and and often it's not getting them out of the mine. It's not getting anyone out of the mine. It's saying, well, maybe we need to to help them a little bit, breathe a little bit better, maybe some breathing devices, but we're not talking about taking everybody and moving them out of the mine. It's not a structural analysis, and how do we know it's not a structural analysis? Well, because everyone who's in the mine isn't included. So one of the reasons it's not a structural analysis is women and girls are not part of it. One of the reasons women and girls are not part of it is because it's not a structural analysis. So the reality is, if the mind is toxic, it's toxic for everybody. But if we're not going to focus on the toxicity of the mind, let's focus on the breathing apparatus of the canaries in it. Right? So one reinforces the other, and the upshot of it is we don't have a robust set of interventions coming from a signature program from the White House to deal with racial inequality. Now, this is not a new idea. This is not a new conundrum. The whole idea that racial justice cannot be achieved unless we focus on individual level problems and individual level solutions has been around for a long time. Um, the exclusion of women and girls uh, from uh, this initiative uh, goes all the way back to Daniel Patrick Moynihan, um, who in the late 60s famously argued that all of the institutional structural interventions in the world aren't going to make a difference as long as the black community is distorted by something called matriarchy. What's matriarchy? Women. 
women being out of control, women trying to control, women defending themselves, women having their own money, their own jobs, women being leaders in their communities, in their families. Moynihan said there might not be anything inherently wrong with the matriarchy, but in a society like ours that's based on the assumption that men lead everything, men represent everything, what happens to men is what is important, what happens to women is less important. In a society like that, when you have a community structure in which women have disproportionate power to what we think they should have, that's a problem. And that was such a problem that Moynihan said we should actually take the boys out of their families and put them in military schools put them in armed forces. This was during the Vietnam War, by the way. So to save them, let's put them in harm's way, because when we put them in those spaces, those are male spaces where they'll learn how to be the proper kind of men. So it's a particular kind of role assumption. If we make our African-American families into traditional, patriarchal, dominated families, if we, if we enforce the normative values of patriarchy on the black community, that's the first step to racial equality. I say that's pretty non-intersectional to me. Right? The idea that to fight against racial injustice, we have to embrace patriarchy. Right? That's effectively the argument. Now, that, was, that argument was, in my mind, kind of dead 50 years ago. To see it come back now is like Jason the 15th. You know, how many times are we going to see this over and over and over again? So this idea of we save boys first both reinforces lack of an institutional critique. It also um, erases what has to happen for a racial inequality to actually happen, which means it has to be married with gender equality. It has got to be married um, with a class critique. It's only if we erase all of the background in which females are paid less for the same work where women are shut out of entire sectors of the workforce, where the standard worker is someone who's defined as someone who doesn't need childcare, where racial stratification among women mean that black women and Latinas end up having $5 of net worth. It's only within a structure that takes that all as a given that you can even wrap your head around thinking that you can have a racial justice agenda that doesn't include women and girls in it. Right. So that's intersectional failure 101. And it's an intersectional failure that I have to say, I'm really shocked that we're still dealing with. And it raises the question, who is the subject of intersectional failure now? Right. When we can talk about boys and their future, and it is absolutely important, how can we fail to talk about girls and their future? And how can we move forward with this? Now, um, intersectionality, I'm going to do a quick primer for those of you uh, not in women and gender studies. Intersectionality is basically the idea that discrimination um, is often on the basis of race, gender, and other ascriptive characteristics. Not because the ascriptive characteristics themselves make you a target, but because in a structure in which race, gender, class, sexual identity, gender performance are subject to organizing rules of society, if you actually embody some of those characteristics, you are subject, not all the time, many of the times, to multiple forms of overlapping discrimination and inequality. That's what happened in DeGraffenry. It's a case I wrote about a long time ago. Black women were basically trying to say, I'm discriminated against on the basis of being black women in an institution that hired whites and hired women, hired blacks and hired men. But the blacks who were hired were men, and the women that were hired were white. In those contexts, Black women were not able to be hired. They tried to make an argument. This is discrimination against us. This is race discrimination the way black women experience race discrimination. This is gender discrimination the way black women experience gender discrimination. The court said not so fast because what you're trying to do is combine two causes of action. You can't do that. Violates the rules. You have to either say race discrimination or gender discrimination. You can't throw them together. That's no fair, foul, preferential treatment. No one else gets to do that. <laughs> Why do you get to do it? 
No one else had to do it, <laughs> you know, but that didn't so much matter, you know, to the court. So, so this idea of intersectionality is both an idea that there are certain kinds of discrimination, certain, kind of, certain kinds of structural inequalities that you're subject to, that's number one, but the real kicker is when the law is supposed to come and deliver you from that discrimination, it tells you to do it, is to give you preferential treatment. I mean, that's what they call adding insult to injury, you know? Um, so, so I was writing about the law, but then as it turned out, it wasn't just the law that did that. It's not just the law that said, you know, we can't pay attention to intersectionality. Um, it was our allies. It was some of our allies in the feminist movement um, who framed questions of gender-based violence and, and, um, and other kinds of discrimination solely in terms of the way it's experienced by women who didn't also have a racial burden. And it was also often uh, by men in our community who framed racial inequality in terms of what happens to bodies that are racialized, but not that are um, female-made bodies. Right? So the whole point uh, was simply to say it's not just law that's the problem, it's us. But that was like 25 years ago. I'm not going to say how much longer it was. It was probably more than that. Um, what I found recently is that it is a continuous problem. We define a problem in gender-exclusive terms. It means that we, 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 we assume that women and girls aren't facing those same things. As it turns out, women and girls are facing them, but there's no data that's actually collected in order to create best practices so that when a moment like this comes along, a president who's willing to actually create a racial justice program, he doesn't really have a lot of information to dispel the initial mistake, which is that women and girls aren't facing any problems. So it becomes a circular problem. What we're in the middle now of is a cycle, a circular problem in which we are building on mistaken assumptions that started the whole exclusive focus on men and boys. And why are we in that moment? Partly because we don't really pay attention to claims that get made all the time. A lot of times people say, hey, you know, the reason why we have to have just these kind of programs is that men and boys just have it worse across the board, everybody knows it, why are you even fighting about it? Well, we decided to look at some of the issues. And we found out, you know, as many times as people keep saying it, including Washington DC schools, for example, um, that because of some of the performance problems among men uh, and boys of color, they're gonna have a, um, a whole new education kind of intervention, new schools, uh, million dollar programs, mentorship, based on the idea that men and boys of color have it um, uh, substantially worse. But we actually started looking at some of the uh, data. Uh, one of the arguments is boys um, have low attendance, and that's why we need to have focused programs. We actually looked at the data, and guess what we found? It's the same. Right? It's the same kind of challenge. Black girls have low attendance rates as well. Um, they also uh, said that satisfaction uh, was lower. As it turns out, that's not true either. Um, one data uh, point after another consistently showed um, that the claim that it is the boys that are exceptionally uh, poorly situated actually um, overlooked the fact that it's black students who are performing so poorly, and Latinos uh, simply beyond that, right? So this is a race problem that's being distorted um, in part because we're not paying attention to the particular ways that girls experience these problems. Um, so the DC school uh, situation is one in which the data don't support the argument, and there's also the reality that some of the things that are happening to girls are not part of our discourse. African-American girls are the fastest growing population in the juvenile justice system. Fastest growing population. It's a fact that just doesn't get repeated much. People don't know what to do with it. They don't have a frame for it, so they don't talk about it. And it doesn't become part of the national crises, the things that we have to intervene on. We decided that we wanted to look at what's happening with girls in the school to prison pipeline, because there was so much conversation um, about boys in the school to prison pipeline, and we know that's really a problem, but we assumed that because we don't talk about the girls, it's not a problem. So we decided, let's look at the girls. We looked 
at the girls in New York and in Boston. So just as a quick way of reading this chart, um, the, 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 the pictures on the left, uh, the first picture is the population, um, and the second picture is the discipline rates. Um, so if you look at uh, black girls in the first quadrant, that's their population. If you look at the discipline rates, that shows you how much more they're disciplined than anyone else in their cohort. So across the board, black girls are tremendously disproportionately disciplined as compared to all other girls. And if you compare the chart from top to bottom, you can see the relative difference between the disproportionality that black girls face and the disproportionality that their same race um, brothers face, right? So they're both disproportionately punished. But the level of disproportionality, actually, among girls is greater. There's a greater spread um, between girls. It doesn't get talked about enough. Overall, we found that black boys are three times more likely to be suspended. Black girls, six times more likely than their white counterpart. It's a way of measuring discrimination that we don't typically talk about because we don't think about race as playing out between women. We just see it as between men and women being sort of secondary. This is what happens when we cast the intersectional lens and actually look at race discrimination between women. We asked women, we asked girls what happened in school. And they told us about the stereotypes that are particular to women who are black, blacks who are women. Have an attitude, hard to control, opinionated, loud, rude, right? Not proper ladies. These are specific stereotypes against specific kind of women, and they led to the disproportionate exclusion. This is the intersectional discrimination and the intersectional abandonment, there really isn't an agenda to deal with this problem. So no one is paying attention to it. Last area, intersectional erasure in mobilizing movements. Black Lives Matter, we all know about it now. right? We all know how many black bodies have been killed by the police. What we don't know, what's not part of this movement, is the number of women who have been killed by police. Black women are also killed by police. Right? But it's really not part of our discourse, partly because we don't envision them. So, so let me do this for a moment, because we've been sitting here for a while, and um, I want to roll into showing you a quick video, and then I'm going to sit down. But to get us ready for it, I want us to loosen up a little bit. So I want everyone just to put up one hand, and when you hear a name that you don't know, I want you to put the name and put your hand down, and it's got to stay down. Okay, so no popping back up, right? So everyone, put one hand up, please. Okay, Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, Freddie Gray. Okay, so we got about half the hands up. Natasha McKenna, Tanisha Anderson, Michelle Cousseau, Maya Hall. OK. So about half of you knew all the men. No one knew all the women. The women's names that I mentioned are all women that were killed within a week to two weeks of all the men who were killed. Okay, this is telling us something about what frames allow us to see and not see, right? Women are also killed by the police, but we don't talk about them. We don't talk about them. We don't have a narrative to put them in. If you don't have a narrative, you forget the facts, right? If the facts don't fit the frame, you can't remember the facts, right? So say her name, quite frankly, is simply a way of talking about all the different circumstances in which black women have lost their lives to police. You know, some of these names you might know, but many of them you don't know. Black females as young as seven and as old as 93 have been killed by the police. Killed in the streets, in their cars, outside of their homes, in their living rooms, in their bedrooms, in their beds. They have been killed by police who they raid their homes on mistaken warrants. 
They've been killed when they or their family members have sought help. They've been killed when the men that they were with were targeting. They've been killed when they are alone. They've been killed driving while black, shopping while black, having mental disabilities or an emotional crisis while black, being homeless or poor while black. They've been strangled to death, beaten to death, tasered to death, and shotgunned to death, sometimes repeatedly at close range, sometimes in the back. The vast majority of them were unarmed, and very few of them were engaging in anything that could remotely justify the use of deadly force. This picture you, hear, you see here, Natasha McKenna, um, who was tasered to death, a woman who was having a mental um, breakdown and asked for the police to come and give her help. They arrested her, put her in a cell, went to extract her with six men dressed in hazmat uniforms, as you can see here. She was completely defenseless, nude. They handcuffed her to the door, told her that she was resisting threw her on the ground, tasered her one time, put her in a restraining chair, tasered her another time, handcuffed her to the restraining chair, tasered her a third time, put a hood on her, and tasered her a fourth time. Everybody was acquitted. No one was even charged. And they released the video. You can see this if, if, if you want. They released the video to reinforce that the officers had acted professionally. Now, black women like black men share this vulnerability. They share the assumptions that they're superhuman, that they're undisciplined, that their very bodies put officers at risk. They share that. What they don't share is recognition, what they don't share is outrage. There, there are no marches for Natasha. She, she's not a name that we all know. Nobody is demanding you know, any national moratorium on her behalf. Why? She's a woman. She's a black woman. She's not someone that fits within the narrative of racial abuse. She's not someone who fits in the narrative of gender abuse. Right? So these are intersectional challenges to the way we think about our movements. When we think about rape and gender-based violence, do we think about the police? Here's a guy who, if we're to believe that the 13 women who came forward, a police officer on duty raped 13 black women. What made him think that he could get away with 13 black women? So let's just think about that for a moment. right? Shockingly, he was finally acquit, uh, uh, convicted uh, for counts stemming from eight of those cases. Question is, is he just a bad cop or is this a structural problem? When we think about what makes black women vulnerable, the fact that they're part of the, many of them are poor, many of them were homeless, many of them were in, in, in involved in the street economy, and many of them had criminal records. Oklahoma has the highest rate of incarceration of women in the entire United States. Do we think that that had nothing to do with Daniel Holdsclaw's recognition that he could probably abuse these women and nobody would ever believe him? So vulnerability to one thing makes you vulnerable to something else. This is a particular aspect, an intersectional way in which some women are subject to particular forms of gender-based violence. It's just not part of our movement. Why? Who is it happening to? Right? It's happening to black women. So we have been on a mission to raise awareness of these issues across the United States. We've had 10 town halls across the US. What are these designed to do to tell the story of what is missing? Where are our failures to build movements anti-racist movements that include all the ways that gender shapes how racism experience? and anti-race movements that reflect every aspect of racial disempowerment. So these have involved stories of individuals who have been willing to come forward and to shape the public will 
to lift up the visibility of these issues so that we can achieve accountability. So I'm going to play, um, in conclusion, the video. And we knew that this might happen. seriously targeted like our lives. My partner is, is Mexican Palestinian. I'm fighting a life sentence for a brother right now. And we're targeted. And it takes a lot of courage to stand up. So this point of this exercise is to notice you're not alone. And we're doing this together. And even when you're physically alone, be right there with you. Be right there with you. They say life is a game of chess, but no one's man enough to treat us like queens, ladies. Remember, you are queens, and no matter how hard they try, they can never rape the royalty out of you. Pick your crown up. This one's for me, for you, for her, for them, for us, for the girls relearning how to look themselves in the eye, who stand tall just because a woman should. This one is for the death of my innocence and the birth of my womanhood that will never be stolen from me. Cheers. This hearing uh, basically began with the observation that the common sense conversation that we've been having in communities of color, the common sense conversation that says, men and boys are the primary object of racism, women and girls are doing okay. Women and girls don't need any particular intervention. Women and girls don't need studies. They don't need resources. They don't need programs. So how are we going to work together to make sure that girls and women do not have to wait for the attention they deserve? Well, one of the ways we do it is we don't wait to start talking. We don't wait to get an invitation from the White House or from the caucus to come and tell our stories. We can create spaces to tell our stories. We can find commissioners to hear the stories. We can find experts who have experienced the stories. We can find young women who embody those stories and have overcome them. We can do that ourselves. So that's what we've started to do. You didn't come here for a show. If you did, you're in the wrong place. You came here for real life and for real strategies for change, for systemic change. Well, you have some educators here who are generously offering education and for you to learn from girls of color and their experiences. As recently as October 2nd, when I got arrested with or 12 other people as a part of the Ferguson 13, nine of us were women, four of us were men that were out and got arrested just for speaking up, just for chanting, this is what democracy looks like. Nine of us were women. And then as we moved on and we realized that there was work to be done, we started to try to get around the organizing tables. So we formed you know, my organization, Molino Activist United, which is entirely women. And we realized that that door wasn't so open. The door to the street was wide open. They were willing, you know, and I say they as a community, were willing to have us sacrifice our bodies, were willing to have us sacrifice our lives. I never got pulled off the front line as a woman, but at the table that door was closed. And even more so, we have to be out here because if we don't speak for the women that are getting killed down as black women, then who will? You know, history has shown us that if, if the mouths of the oppressed don't speak up, then no one will speak up for you. The way God taught us to be was not to dress in girl clothes, so I was locked in an attic. I remember being locked in an attic for two weeks, and she would come and, like, slide bread underneath the door, and she would say, you're going to learn. 
that as long as you think you're an animal and want to appear in the streets, this is how we treat you. And that day was my redefining moment. I put all my clothes in a suitcase. We lived in a three-story home. I tied all my bed sheets, and I said, this is it. And I jumped out the window, and I remember hitting the floor, but when I hit that floor, I felt so free. Free of pain, free of neglect, and free of shame, because I refused to live in that. And oftentimes, a lot of the people who said they loved me, they didn't understand me. So how can you love someone who you don't understand? I had no face in the foster care system. I saw no care. When I was eight, they didn't help me, so I didn't believe they would help me now. But my mom needed help. I saw my mother relapsing. I met with the caseworker, and I started to tell him my situation. Before I could finish, she asked me, how old was I? I told her, 17. She asked me, when will you be turning 18? I told her, August. Her response went from apparent willingness to help to, we'll see what I can do. I wanted you to think about a time in your life when you're moving forward or backwards or staying in the same position and the hinge of your balance of what one person wants to do for you. Uh -huh. That was a very common place that you would be in in the foster care system. So we were hidden. So I didn't go to welfare because I didn't want no one to know I was homeless. Mm -hmm. Because the first thing they're going to do is worry children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I couldn't go down to get the housing authority to help me because the first thing I'll worry your kids. Mm -hmm. My kids were my responsibility. Mm -hmm. They were my, and they were going to remain that way. So yes, we struggled probably a little bit more. I could have went and mm -hmm. got help, but that would have messed up our whole family oh, dynamic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rapes of Native women and girls are so high upon my tribal lands that during a group discussion with young girls, the question was asked, what would you do if you were raped? A young Native girl stood up and said, well, my mom and I already talked about that, that when I'm raped, we won't report it because we know nothing will happen and we don't want to cause problems for our family. The reality of this 14-year-old girl wasn't a matter of if she's raped, but when. You know, and criminalization is held between all of us. Women, we get beat for no reason. I was raped when I was nine years old. Nobody was there when I was raped. Nobody helped me. And when I went to the cops, they did nothing. The man is still running the streets. I don't, I don't see why the justice system has, you, you let rapists and you let people that hurt children out on the streets. A guy killed my brother when I was 15, about seven years ago, and they released him. They acquitted him after five years of being in jail. You let killers and rapists on the streets, but you enslaved young people when a lady shot off warning shots in Florida for 25 years. I didn't want to view it as a racial issue. I didn't want to until I followed some cases down the road a couple of months later. A white woman went to go buy drugs from the projects. She got thrown from a window. The city paid her an enormous amount of money, made sure she was taken care of. She's still living to this day. A little while later, a woman's dog got shot by the police. They immediately fired the police office. Immediately gave her, compensated her, they said their apology. You want to know what they said to me? Well, you close your eyes and you will see exactly what they said to me. <laughs> Nothing. I went down to the mayor's office. We rallied. They wanted to get us arrested. The superintendent of the police, he said the shooting was justified. <laughs> How? Is the murder of a young black woman justified? It's not. That is innocent. You tell me what the justice is in that. We went to trial. Four of us went to trial. Me, um, Venice Brown, Renata Hill, Terrain Dandridge. We went to trial. Um, before trial, they kept a lot of evidence out of trial. They wouldn't allow us to talk about our backgrounds from. Um, some of us being raped to police brutality, police harassment, um, men harassments, they wouldn't allow us to talk about it and, and try to justify why we reacted the way we reacted. The media dehumanized us. They called us vultures, a wolf pack of lesbians. Um, 
we, we had no chance. We was found guilty before we even went to trial. And one thing I wanted to talk about today, you know, is thinking about in all the story, really powerful stories and testimonies we've heard that oftentimes women, in addition to doing these things, are responsible for caretaking, right? So, you know, while we're being harassed by those construction workers, we're walking home, rushing home often to feed our brothers and sisters that we're, we're responsible for, right? So while we're dealing with being immigrants, xenophobia, the oppression that comes along with maybe being undocumented, we're also running with our mothers to the doctor's office to be translators, That's right. Mm -hmm. right? So while young moms are dealing with being young moms, we're also cleaning up beer bottles maybe from our uncle, mm -hmm. making sure people are coming in safe at night, and this often adds, you know, undue pressure in our own lives, right? Potentially, you know, pushing us out of school, forcing us to get, you know, jobs, second, third jobs, working late into the night while we're still responsible for caretaking. I spent a big part of the summer interviewing a black woman in my family for this book I'm working on, on familial relationships with trauma, sexual violence, language, and food. I never heard the words rape or sexual violence or sexual assault in my house as a child, though I saw the effects of it on the faces of my mother and my aunties. So I asked my grandmother directly about her experience with rape and sexual violence. My grandma was in a wheelchair now, so she had me wheel her around to the side of the house. There she, I kneeled down, and my grandmama told me a story about the white foreman at her job and what he did to her. Mm -hmm. She told me a story about the white man who owned the house she cleaned and what he did to her. Mm -hmm. She told me a story about her black father and what he did to her. She told me a story about her black uncle and what he did to her. She told me stories about the white, black, and Mexican men who worked on the line at her chicken plant and what they did to her. She told me stories about the deacons at the church, men we all looked up to and what they did to her. Mm -hmm. mm. And finally, she told me stories about what her husband, my grandfather, did to her. Mm. Mm. And when she stopped talking, she forced a fake smile and she rubbed my back and she told me, I'm okay, Key, mm. I'm okay. Mm -hmm. For the first time in my life, I took my grandmama's hand off my back, I held it and I told her, no, you're not. Mm. I loved, I told her I love you so much, grandmama but I know you're not okay. Black girls like black boys scar. Black women like black men scar. Wow. And the national negligence and communal lack of love are responsible for that scarring. We can't do anything going forward until we reckon with the cause, shape, and neglect of those scars because those scars are real and we are responsible. until the public will to address these issues is curated and nurtured. And that nurturing has to begin by centering the lives of women and girls in settings where their allies, their families, their public officials, and others understand the contours of the lives that otherwise would be written off. So I, I hope this video um, uplifts those experiences and the barriers that women and girls of color face um, across the plateau. Um, and that it helps create an agenda that leaves no person uh, of color in and outside the quest for racial justice. I really uh, can't think of a better time than now to create a new inheritance for um, uh, our sons, our daughters, every um, child in our community born today, not a better legacy than the one that we can foster that supports an inclusive vision of racial justice, one that uh, tends to the needs that genuinely embraces all of us. Thank you.
Thank you, Professor Crenshaw. That was uh, powerful and moving. And um, I'm excited that you all are still here and have a chance to interact with um, Professor Crenshaw now. So we're going to open the microphones up for uh, questions uh, and perhaps answers, at least reflections. Conversation. Conversation. Conversation, yeah. yeah. And um, perhaps even a little a testimony if it feels appropriate. So um, we're going to leave the mics in the stands, if you wouldn't mind queuing up here. Uh, to speak at one of the mics, and we'll just <coughs> alternate um, back and forth between them. And yeah. uh, feel free to jump on. Maybe we can have two or three at a time, so we can just create more of a chorus of conversation rather than a, just dialogue between me and you all. I don't know, Professor Crenshaw, you spent a lot of time in Minnesota, but this is the Minnesota way. It'll take yeah. like three yeah, or four no. minutes. I thought as much. Like thinking about it. You know, we can talk about a few things. Yeah, 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 come on up. Um, this might be my first time being nervous speaking. You are a hero to me, so it's an honor to be this close to you. <laughs> um, so I do educational programming around relationship violence and sexual assault and yeah. gender issues. And I work very closely with um, the transgender community as well. And obviously when you're talking about sexual violence, race needs to be a part of that conversation as well. Mm -hmm. So as an individual that holds not only a racial but a gender privilege, I oftentimes get pushback uh, about that when I'm trying to have these conversations. Mm -hmm. Do you have any insight or advice on how I can continue to bridge that gap while acknowledging my privilege? Mm. Okay, that's a good question. Any, any others to pair up, have a convo? All right, I'll let you guys simmer a little bit. Um, you know what? Um, I tend to think about that from the vantage point of when I first started writing from the position of the person without the privilege and how I wanted some of my colleagues with privilege to respond. And it's actually a little different from how some people thought about it. So um, I wrote Mapping the Margins after maybe two years of doing a lot of um, anti-violence work in contexts where there was almost always a debate about the extent to which the white feminist framework was capacious enough to be responsive to the ways that women of color experience violence. And there were, um, you know, obvious, uh, um, actually uh, different points of view about what should be done with that critique. Um, there, there, there were some who made the move, um, you should be an expert on my experience and you should say something about it. Actually, that wasn't my position. I didn't want, I didn't want that. What I wanted was space. What, what I wanted was the handing of a baton, or at least showing it to me, where I could figure out where I could grab onto it and, and, and remake the conversation to the extent that I thought it was necessary to make clear what difference my difference made. Because I wasn't really about just add my name to the list and I'm happy, right? I wanted a more substantive engagement on the issues where I thought it really mattered. Some of them were clear differences and some of them actually were not. And so my point was, let's create the space, the conversation, the camaraderie, the trust that's necessary for me to trust that when I start telling you what, where my differences are, where the an analytical um, consequence of those differences is made clear, that you will take that up and move with it. So I wanted space, right? I didn't want, I didn't want them to fill the space with more of their talking. Um, and that, that to me is how I think about other moments like this, right? It, it's uh, a question about how um, does this framework accommodate and address 
transgender issues, immigrant issues, uh, women who are dis differently abled. Um, you know, there, there are a range of ways in which intersectionality plays out. I think the project is an ongoing developmental and coalitional one. And the question is, how do we create the space for those new articulations to come to, to fore? So sometimes it's being more quiet. <laughs> um, sometimes it's saying, this is the, this is the degree to uh, it that I can understand, I can, I can, you know, um, think beyond where I'm at, but of course I can't think completely into another space, and I shouldn't. You should think into the space in the way that it is organic and responsive and open and politically uplifting. So that that's kind of how I think about it. Now, at the end of the day, it's always about what the actual argument is about, right? You know, because sometimes we do say stupid things and we just have to own it. Hey. Hi, I'm Shannon Miller. I'm chair of the Department of Gender and Women's Studies at Minnesota State Mankato. I'm also a black lesbian mother. And I'm just curious, um, I, I hope you hear, feel my question and where it's coming from. Where I see intersectionality and how it's misused as almost post-racial. So intersectionality is post-racial. Yeah. Um, and where, and how racism is missed out of intersectionality. So um, being someone who studies multiple identities, holding these multiple identities, I find myself, particularly in gender and women's study spaces, uh, pushing for the racism and race and intersectionality and getting this, well, we can look at other identities and how they intersect, but missing the piece, the foundation on race and racism, or the first racial racism in um, gender and women's studies is saying, if I just name a race, then I'm doing intersectionality. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah. Um, I appreciate that. Um, that's not how I think about intersectionality, you know. Um, so, but I will say that I recognize that move. <laughs> I will say that I've seen it um, and um, can, you know, kind of, uh, give you um, a whole set of stories about it being made in, in to me. <laughs> like, you know, um, you're, you're not intersectional because you're talking about, you know, structural racism. And I was like, I think to talk about structural racism, you have to be intersectional. That's what a structured inequality looks like. It's structured through you know, a matrix of power, and you need to be comfortable, you know, talking about that. Um, so I recognize it, I don't agree with it. Um, uh, I think what is challenging um, um, is what do we make of the fact that it happens? Is it a problem with intersectionality? Is it a problem with um, the constant desire to escape racism? more particularly the constant desire to es escape anti-black racism. That's a real distinction in our capacity to talk um, about race. Um, is it simply the fact that all theories and concepts and ideas are multiply um, uh, open to lots of different deployments? That's, that's you know, what ideas you know, do a lot. So I'm not... Um, uh, I'm not overly stressed by it. Um, I kind of see people using all sorts of things for to shut down conversations. A, a case in point that um, also implicates intersectionality. A lot of new conversation about class. We should have, you know, class-based interventions. Um, uh, it, it, these arguments are often deployed to suppress race. We don't want to talk about race, let's talk about class. The moment race is off the table, those folks who want to talk about class are gone too. <laughs> you know, so um, I think that, it, and, and that's of course not saying anything about the value of a class critique, the value of an understanding of economic formation, the value of understanding the history of capitalism, the fact that it's sometimes used to suppress something else doesn't mean that that stuff isn't all right. It just means people are using it like they use any number of ideas, um, often as aggressive ways of shutting down other ideas. So for me, you know, 
the move is simply to use intersectionality back, right? To say, no, intersectionality is not non-racial. It's not post-racial. It's a particular way of thinking about race. That's, in my view, what, what intersectionality brings to that conversation. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, so as a woman of color, I've dealt with discrimination throughout my entire life. I know what to do. I know how to react. Um, when I draw, where I draw blank is when I face discrimination um, and racism from people of color and women of color who are in very much the same or similar situations to me, and I, I like don't understand it and don't know what to do about that and why it's happening. So tell me more about what you don't understand about it. I get not knowing what to do, so but. I, I feel like it's, I think it's internalized oppression. So you but understand it. I do understand it. But <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just don't know what to do about it. Okay, <laughs> all right. Good. I thought we were going back further. Okay, so now we're on the same page. Yeah, okay. Um, I get it too. Um, I get it too. Right? From, from allies, uh, people who ought to be allies, from students, uh, from colleagues. Um, so, you know, in, when, when we say we live in a society that's structured in a hierarchical way, it means that it's structured, right? Um, it means that even those of us who are situated in particular subordinate ways in relationship to others can also reproduce that uh, to others. Actually, what I'm interested in uh, along those lines is what does intersectionality bring to internalized racism? Like we know as people of color, you know, that we often perform um, certain um, distancing moves with each other or we, we reject in people that look like us things that we've been told we are in order to feel better about ourselves. I mean, that's kind of, you know, one on one. Um, I'm kind of interested in does it play out any differently among women? Um, you know, what, what are the different and more limited ways in which women gain value in society? You know, from the time we're kids, little girls, we know that cuteness makes a big difference in what life is like for us. We know where we rank with respect to a whole lot of other women. We know what society values as pretty and desirable and what society does not. And we often perform our value against other women who are either below us or above us, right? We want to be friends, we want to distance. We think we're cuter than, we think they, who counts, right? Um, and I think those ways of performing what we consider to be value um, are, are, are actually somewhat uniquely framed around uh, our embodiment. Um, uh, embodiments that often can't be uh, performed around by being an athlete or being popular or something like that. So I kind of think that there's some space now to think more about internalized oppression when it's looked at through race, gender lens, I think even um, you know, gender performance. There's a lot of ways in which all the hierarchies that play out actually are in some ways aggregated and thus aggravates um, the intra-racism, intra-sexism um, that, that we experience, um, which is all to say it's really, you know, not surprising that we have it. Um, to figure out how to navigate around it, there needs to be much more visibility about when it's playing out. We need to have names for it. You know, it's a little, you know, wooden right now, it's into racism, right? I think we need to have more like, that's doing the nene, you know, or that's the, you know, specific forms of it. Because, you know, you fight power by being able to name it. So people have a frame for it, you see it, you call it out, and people go, oh, I wasn't meaning that move, right? So, so for me, that, that's one of the things that, you know, when I see a pattern happening over and over and over, I. I name things, so I try to put a name to it, right? I think it's a collective project um, that I would see us all engaged in. In terms of personally, 
you know, how to handle it, you know, um, without names, it's often hard to get people to attend to it. I mean, that's just the reality. I find the deeper problem that I have is internalizing what happened. You know, I, I'll often, you know, go through five different explanations before the more obvious one is one that I can feel comfortable accepting. And I want to get to a point where I can get there faster and not really carry the burden of the repudiation because that's a repudiation that actually hurts more than the repudiation that you've been taught to experience or expect through your entire life. So I don't know if that's helpful other than I can say, I, you know, I feel you, I see it, I think we should work to name it. Hi, I'm a student here and I'm involved in some campus organizations that deal with like big overwhelming problems and I guess I'm just wondering what do you do to stay inspired and what do you do to keep moving forward in the face of like massive societal issues? Yeah, um, so I, I get on planes and, and go to places like, you know, here to see bright, shiny faces like yours who, you know, spend a Friday night in a room like this who really want to talk about issues like the ones we've talked about. I mean, as long as there um, are people who see these issues as things that really do make a difference in your day, you know, that really do call, you know, upon your time and, and you know, more of you, um, it's, it keeps me inspired. So, you know, if there were five of you here, I'd be inspired. It's like five people wanted to talk about this. It's really important. The fact that there's a whole lot more than five of you, I've got some inspiration to last for about, you know, six months. So this is a good, this is a good thing. Um, so that keeps me inspired. In fact, now having done this for a long time, um, seeing student, former students actually come back and tell me amazing things that they've done um, and things that they've done that they, um, you, know, you know, that were structured onto things that we worked on and talked about, being able to pick up the phone and talk to someone and say, you know, I have a problem, I have a student who's looking for, uh, that kind of thing, building a network of transformation, the network of possibilities, you know, there's nothing quite, you know, as satisfying as that. Now, would I like to see, like, the real time possibilities of a lot of this stuff actually being, you know, m moving our society? Yeah, I would like to, to see that um, uh, quickly. But I have to say, this conversation here um, with women and girls of color, in the last year, um, the White House has had a major convening on women and girls of color. Not quite in the frame that I would like, but they did it and wouldn't have done it were it not for women across the country standing up and insisting. Um, just last month, um, there, is, uh, there was an announcement that there's going to be um, the NOVA Foundation is going to spend $90 million on women and girls of color. Um, this is a foundation that used to spend a lot, along with a lot of other foundations, their vision of women and girls of color was not one that had a USA zip code. You know, so the whole idea that, you know, uh, lift half the sky, you know, educate a girl and you educate her family, all this stuff applied over there. It never was something that people talked about here. That's changed in less than two years. Right? Um, uh, African American congresswomen uh, last month announced that there was going to be a caucus. Uh, on uh, black women and girls. That's unprecedented. So, so these are, um, you know, changes that the changing discourse has made possible. That's tremendously efficacious. Just the fact that some people refuse to shut up made certain things possible. So if they start yelling, I can only guess what might happen. So all that's inspiring to me. Hi, hey. I'm a junior student, GWS student here, and something that I noticed in the video, um, specifically talking about the struggles that black women face, my question really, I'm asking how existing as a black woman in a space like Gustavus where the commonality or the solidarity within those, ex those specific experiences just aren't there, how do you find solidarity or how do you find a mode of space that will actually 
you know, push forth that action when, you know, people can just get tired of listening to you and tell you to shut up, especially when you don't have people standing with you in solidarity all the time. Yeah, yeah. You know, you guys ask questions that are like, yeah, tell me. I'm trying to figure that out, too. I mean, I teach at Columbia Law School. You know, so, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of the challenge. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, so I think you guys are kind of seeing how you exist, right? You, 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 you say it because you believe it. You write it because you know it's true. You do it despite the fact that there aren't existing frames to let you do it. You fashion together the space that you need in order to situate your project where you are. You know, so. Um, my work on critical race theory, intersectionality, it was all um, a product of thinking, okay, the institution that I exist in has people who do the work that they do from their vantage point. It's not really called from their vantage point, but it is from their vantage point. If that's what they do, then I'm going to do the same thing. Um, and, 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 you know, sort of committing to that and sticking with it when it's not easy, right? There are people who say, you know, you, sh you, should, you should fly with all the other geese in that direction because you're flying over there. <laughs> you don't get picked off. Um, but, you know, the reality is I couldn't fly that way, um, and so I wouldn't have been a good flyer in that pack, uh, if, if that's what they're called, whatever it is when they fly, flock. Um, uh, and, but it also meant that, um, it was easier for me to find the other people who are flying my direction, right? So, yeah, it's the truth that in, in an institution or in spaces where you, you're kind of singularly doing the work, or at least it feels like it, it does feel isolating. The good news is that if you continue doing it and you represent what it is you do um, in, in, a, in a, a powerful way, it draws people to your work and people that are doing some of the same stuff gets drawn to you. So, you know, the group will never be large. I mean, critical race theory at, at its height was, you know, no more than maybe 60 people. But they transformed, you know, legal education, partly because it was tight. You know, if you, if you found your way to a critical race theory workshop, it was like going through the bushes, <laughs> right? Chopping up, like everybody got to the clearing. And they were really happy to be there and really um, contributed everything they had to making that project work. So, yeah, in our individual institutions, we, we were often one of one or one of two, but um, the collective collaborative was that much stronger because we actually invested everything into making the intellectual project one that had deep roots, intellectual roots, institutional roots, and that lived. So, you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a story of like, just say it this way and everybody will jump behind you. Um, it's not quite like that, but saying it and sticking with it and putting your gut into it, because you know, at the end of the day, if you're a gut, you know, motivated person, that's always there for you, right? It's 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 my source more than anything. I'm not I'm not an intellectual because I like to just sit and think. You know, I've got there are things that I feel and I want to put words to it and I want to figure out how to make it make sense and speak to other people. As long as that's there. You know, I, I think I think that's the, the groundwork that allows you to continue to exist and thrive. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm currently working on a fiction story where one of the main characters is um, a black woman, a woman of color, and um, I just, as someone who doesn't have that perspective, I was just wondering if you knew like what were the main what are the major problems currently with the representation of women of color in fiction? Do you have any <laughs> thoughts about that? Or well, okay, um, that's a, that's an interesting question. You know, I do law, right? Yeah, I was just wondering if you had any thoughts, or I knew that wasn't really your um, area, but you know, nothing. I don't have so I don't 
have thoughts about like things that I, if we were having drinks together, I would say, hey, you know, so and so and so, but just, you know, basically try to pontificate on something when I'm sure there are people here in the Sorry. audience who have much more expertise on it. I, I would feel kind of weird saying that. Okay. But I was, but I think it's a good question. So, uh, so I, I, I'll say, I'll say one little itty bitty thing. Who's got some thoughts about this? I see some. So now, now we have a conversation going. Um, can you hear? Yeah, I can hear. OK, go ahead. And, and let's, let's be honest, I mean, that's almost always the first reaction. But then let's also be honest, when stuff go, gets produced and there are no women of color in it, we sometimes get pissed. So, you know, I mean, it's a hard question. I, I do think it's a, hard, it's a hard question. I mean, you know, we, we live in a society in which the productive, you know, capacities for imagination, the productive, I mean, being able to produce, get out, publish, is, 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 is tremendously disproportionately distributed. You know, there are very few people who produce and have that production get out, and it's often not, you know, the most underrepresented people. So the, the long run, of course, we want more productive capacity. The short run is, you know, stuff is happening while we're waiting for it. So um, I, I do want to, I do want, I mean, that's why I say I don't have an answer, but I see what the problem is. I think the problem is a, is a significant one. And it, to be honest, it's also not helped. See, I said I wasn't going to say anything. This is the problem when you get me talking. It's not helped when some of the things that are produced by people of color reproduce the very stereotypes that we get pissed about when other people do it. And you know, if we just look around at some of the stuff that's out there, you know, watching BET is not necessarily better than some of the other stuff. I mean, I get as mad about some of the stuff I see that's produced by people who look like me as I get mad about stuff that's not. So it, it, I, I do think there's a conversation about, um, so how do we even know the characters that we know, partly because they're represented by certain tropes that get reproduced over and over again. So we learn to consume you know, certain signifiers around race and around race and gender. That's just part of you know, what it is. I mean, anybody now can do cookie regardless of their color, and everybody will know. I mean, if y'all know who Cookie is, I know what you've been watching. <laughs> Th that characterization is something that many of us enjoy, but we also know it's producing you know, certain representational tropes that now are going to be firmly part of the culture, and there will be cookies from now on in, and any number of people will reproduce them and, and do it. So I enjoy it, and I, it's a guilty thing, because I know that I'm looking at something that is in some way a representational problem. I mean, that, and so that it's just real. And like I said, I don't know the answer to it, but I do want to affirm that that's an initial reaction, and that's a worry that I think is a real worry. Yeah, go ahead. Conversation. Um, so I have a question. Yeah. Um, would it be um, an intersectionality, like in doing it? Is it appropriate sometimes? And like, is it a good way to do intersectionality by saying like I? this is where I need to step back from it. Yeah, 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 I agree, okay. I agree. I mean, that, that was a little bit of our conversation, right? Um, um, sometimes it is important to step back, even when people are calling you to step forward, 
right? Because there, there are often dif disagreements even within communities about who should speak and what should they speak about and what their responsibilities are. You know, so I, I agree with that. I, I, I do think that there is no safe harbor really. You know, at the end of the day, you've got to simply take into account, you know, different ways of being unresponsive and just figure out what is the course of action that you most believe you can support. And, yeah? Yeah, yeah. And that makes me think about representation. Like yeah. How much, like, when does representation matter? Does it always matter? Like, can we keep pushing for representation? Like, is that okay? Do you think? I think it's okay. Yeah. I think it's, I think, yeah, I'd like to see more representation. And, and what do we do about the intra-racial, intra-gender stuff that we were just talking about <laughs> early when, you know, the people who are producing the representations that we think are like, no, not that, or do we ask them to step back too? I mean, there are a few people I want to ask to step back, you know? <laughs> like, really? Um, no. But, <laughs> you know? Okay. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Whew. Hi. Hi. A little tall for this mic, sorry. Um, thank you for giving this presentation. It's been very enlightening. One of the things that I found most, uh, I guess, appalling is the most appropriate word I can put on it, is... Uh, the section of your presentation that focused on police brutality uh, mm. in regards to black women and the lack of media coverage surrounding that issue. Um, I was wondering what you think, this is another I think question, I'm sorry about that, <laughs> but um, what you think uh, is, is the best approach for us as consumers to kind of change that, mm. change that norm, change that yep. like tendency in the media? Thank you. Thanks for that question. Um, so we just have, so our white, our Say Her Name campaign um, was our way of trying to figure out a, a simple f way to begin, which is, um, you know, an imperative, uh, say her name, which means you've got to go know her name, which means you've got to actually look to find who they are, and they're not going to be given to you. Um, so uh, actually, that's a great segue, because um, uh, we, have, we have say her name stuff out there. Uh, we created a report that has as many names that we could find in the context in which these women were killed. The idea being, um, you need a frame, you need a narrative around which to understand what makes certain women vulnerable to police violence. What are some of the factors? So um, the, the, the report actually has uh, the names um, and the stories. But beyond that, um, we, we created a, a word puzzle um, that has the names of um, dozens of black women killed by the police, but you actually have to look at it. You remember those puzzles that you used to have a kid and you would circle the name? We wanted that to symbolize you've got to work for it. It's not as though it's just going to be handed to you. You have to take it upon yourself to actually look and try to find it. I'm telling you it happens. But the media is, are not going to tell you that it happens, which means that you've got to take the extra step, exercise some serious agency in trying to be part of the Say Her Name movement. So um, as consumers and as activists, um, we have to be critical uh, and know that the spaces in between the stories are the stories, not just the stories that we get. Um, for any of you who watch Confirmation, I've got some stories to tell you about that. Um, but uh, the, basic, the basic point is that if there is more demand to say their names, if we make it part of the practice, then the practice will actually drive greater accountability. We started Say Her Name, we were in, in marches in New York and um, in, in Los Angeles, and um, you know the names were part of the chants. The names of the men were part of the chants, and so then we would start chanting women's names and people would look at us like we were crazy. What are you talking about? Right? So some people, you know, gave us the big thumbs up. Thanks for, you know, including the women. Others were just aghast. I mean, they would come and look at the posters like, how can this be? And we're like, yes, it can be, right? Because this is not just about um, 
the police against hypermasculinity. This is not just the framing of you know, modern day lynching. It is modern day lynching um, through um, different kinds of ways in which certain bodies are made vulnerable. It's not all just male. Um, so um, once we started saying it, um, you know, people started joining in and giving us names and, and writing to us, did you know about this case? Did you know about that case? So um, the two things that I want to say, um, be aggressive in finding the information. Um, and, and number two, share the information once you find it. It's a whole new world now. Um, with digital media. This report that we made would not have been possible because there is no database that collects all the information. And those uh, newspapers that do collect the information often don't report what happens to women because they don't know what to do with it. So we had to rely on family members who posted things, lawyers who posted things. It was basically a democratically produced um, piece of, of information. So join us in that. Um, the African American Policy Forum is online. We like people to come and look at our stuff, sign up, you know, we'll flood your email with all the stuff that we can find. And, and that's uh, effectively the way we're building the movement outward. Hi. We have time for two more questions. OK. OK. So um, I'm from Sweden. and. Um, when we're talking about sharing, I wonder if you have any um, international perspective or if you have any international cooperation because I know from my own experience with friends um, and just news and things like that, that the discrimination towards black populations throughout Europe and Scandinavia is increasing and so, and they don't have quite the same kind of community as the African American community. And so I'm just wondering if there's any cooperation or any future ideas. Like, yeah. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, I don't, I've been to Sweden a few times. I give talks in Sweden. I've, um, you know, noted the, <laughs> I, I don't, I could be tired, but. One of the things that was so interesting when I got to Sweden is that um, my host was asking me if I wanted to kind of take a tour um, of, of um, wherever I was <laughs> to, to learn about how, you know, um, what race was like, I mean, what, what, what outsiders were like. And in the process, she kept using the word blackheads. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. I've never heard of that being the term for black people. And she's like, no, it's not black people. It's, it's everybody who's not Swedish. I mean, everybody who's not blonde. You know, basically folks who hail from the South or historically must have hailed from the South. I was like, man, that's a version of whiteness that I've just never quite <laughs> seen before. I was amazed about it. Um, but that said, it was, a, it, you know, it was, it was very interesting just to see how, you know, we all know race is socially constructed, it's marked differently in different places. So, you know, the racial structures of discourse and how people were represented and applied to people who in this country would never be seen as a racial other. So I just kind of, I mean, I won't say it blew my mind, but it was really interesting to see it play out in a place where I was looking at most of the people and I saw, you know, I saw white people. Um, and, and obviously there were distinctions. I understand that now, you know, it was like maybe several years ago since I've been there, that with immigration and with, you know, the refugee crisis and a whole range of things that the questions around race have become heightened. I think it is a, um, a, a um, a, a, a potentially explosive situation in part because in European um, academic discourse, the framing around race is highly contested. Um, I, I mean, this is the case with respect to intersectionality. I, I went to a conference one time, inter intersectionality, 20, 20 years of intersectionality. Um, and, and the debate was, we like intersectionality, but we're not so sure about this race stuff. So can we kind of take the ideas and apply them and work with them without having to take that baggage crap that comes from the United States? So it was really interesting because, you know, I didn't ask to go there. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I was invited. Um, and so I think one of the challenges is that because the dominant sensibility is that race is not something that's endemic to Europe, 
the resistance to some of the conceptual and political tools that have been developed in other contexts like UK, South Africa, United States that are robustly about race are really, really contested. So now that the race problem it has, you know, the wool has been ripped off, I think it's really drawing the question whether those demands are going to come from, you know, society and how they're going to get translated through the academy. The reason why I exist and, and many scholars of color and women exist is that the academy here was expanding at a time when all these movements were coming up. And so spaces were made, not a lot, but spaces were made for you know, scholars of color and women to be part of it. The European academy is smaller, tighter, more traditional, more patriarchal, more white. So whether that will actually develop into intellectual projects is one question, and then whether there is a political movement is actually a co connected one, but a slightly different question. So yeah, I'm interested to see how it's going to unfold there. Yep, yep, yep. All right, and then my question was um, related to one of your early points in the thing about how racial difference and inequality without talking about racial power creates like an individual response of blame. Yep. And I was, something that I made a connection to with some of my classes is um, the focus on particularly US capitalism on individual, like mm. if you work hard enough, you should be doing this, it's your fault that you're poor, things like that. Yep. Do you yep. think that plays into the way that race is talked about as well? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Like like um, you know, the so the most I won't say the most significant, but one of the myths that gets deployed against the argument that we still are living in a post segregationist, post slavery society is the myth of individualism, is the idea that people get what they work hard for. And it's a myth that people believe even as they're experiencing privileges that have been passed down to them, right? So you can, you can believe that, you know, I got this education because I worked hard even though dad took out a loan on a house to get it and other people don't even have a house to take it out on, right? So, you know, um, so, so, and, well, I'll make, a, I'll make a, a pitch too about tomorrow. So tomorrow we're gonna have a structural racism training and it is a simulation where we play um, this game called the structural, um, the, the, the um, unequal opportunity race. For those of you who haven't seen it, there is a video on our, our website. It's also on YouTube. It's called the unequal opportunity race. And has anyone seen it? Oh, so you guys have seen it. So it's basically a way of telling the story. It's a way of telling a story that um, we live in a society in which several, several generations of people running around the track have happened before people of color were even, even able to get in the race. And as they come into the race, all these other structural barriers get in the way um, that make it difficult for the, the race to be fair. We basically used it as a way of saying, Make, paying attention to the obstacles that are on the track that affect some groups as opposed to others is not preferential treatment. Removing those obstacles is not reverse discrimination. Actually failing to remove those obstacles, that's discrimination. So the whole point is to sort of historicize precisely um, the point you're making. Um, so I have found that even though people see the track and kind of get into it, until they, they're actually on the track, until they're actually running, you know, in the race lane that they're in, they really don't have answers to the questions about, so how come my grandfather came here in 1935 with nothing and he made him, and, and these people couldn't. The, you can know it, but until you actually, even in a simulated way, are standing there waiting for the baton to get passed to you and it's not coming, right? Because grandma didn't get social security because she was black or Latino and she was in the, one of the two professions that were excluded from it. Or dad didn't get a veteran's loan because none of the communities that were allowing people to move in accepted black people in it. 
I mean, they got to sort of figure out how they're in the strain of history and the stuff they get it wasn't simply the product of someone else's hard work. Hard work has something to do with it, but it doesn't have everything to do with it. So, so the game tries to, to, to tell that. The last thing I'll say is this. This stuff is controversial, you know, thinking so much that there's an effort afoot now to suppress this conversation. So our track metaphor, is what I call it, uh, was shown in a Black History Month assembly in, in Rico County, Virginia, um, apparently to two large groups like this um, to talk about, so what does this tell us of, about you know, current inequality? How can we talk about it differently? Did I say this was Virginia? Let me say it again. In Rico County, Virginia, is uh, a suburb of Richmond, Virginia. Y'all know Richmond, Virginia, the cradle of the Confederacy. They're still like all over town, all the Confederate soldiers. I mean, this is a place that's living its history, right? So this is an attempt to historicize that history. One of the students um, told her grandfather, who was an activist in town, who immediately called Fox News. Fox News um, told this story and called it a white guilt video. Um, it's being shown to your children. You know, you got to do something about it. So then these parents called up and say, why are you showing my kid a white guilt video? And the school board said, oh, we're, we didn't mean to. We're sorry. So they issued an apology for showing the unequal opportunity raise and said that should never have happened. We're never going to show that again. They banned the video. Now. We're talking an education arena, right? And you don't have to like everything. You can disagree with something, but to say we're going to ban any conversation about structural inequality because it makes some of the students feel bad, what kind of society are we educating our young people to participate in when a video gets banned because it makes people feel bad? I mean, really? So, so I say all that to say, A, it's important to have skills to talk about precisely the issue you raise. B, it's important to realize that that conversation um, is now a, a conversation that some people rightly feel that they can suppress. I say that to say that in some states, like Arizona, they've actually created a law to ban ethnic studies because they say it promotes intra interracial uh, resentment, right? Colonialism doesn't promote inter, <laughs> but talking about it as a problem does. So we've, we've got to be prepared to resist that. Thank you very much. Thanks again, Professor Crenshaw. Again, if, if, if you're moved by what you heard here tonight or that these are interesting things to talk about, uh, major declaration forms right over here. Step right, <laughs> step right up. Uh, 